he would bring you out and show you the way. Amen. Perhaps today there are some that need to be shown the way. Amen. And I'm glad that if you are one of those that you're here today, for I feel God's call to show you the way from his holy, infallible, inerrant word. Amen. Amen. Isn't it good to be in the Lord's house? Amen. We were coming back from somewhere, and I know that says something about my age when I say we were coming back from somewhere. I can't remember where you've been. But anyway, we had, we had a car load of boys in the, in the car with us, and I, I was trying to use that as an opportunity to share something about the word of the Lord with them. Uh, I don't know if you've ever tried to do that with them sitting in the back and you're in the front. Uh, it's not an easy task to do that, you know? But, but anyway, I was able to say a few words and we were talking about going to church. And uh, I said, you know, and I know this is not new and original with me, but hopefully it made a point. I said, you know, when I was your age, when I was just a teenager, I said, uh, I, got, I, I had a drug problem. I got drugged to church, whether I liked it or not. <laughs> and I, I know that there are folks that are young folks. I know some that are middle-aged folks. I know some that are mature-aged folks that seem to think that the only way that they need to go to church is if they get drugged there. But I'm so glad that we have an opportunity to be in the Lord's house today and to have an opportunity to fellowship, an opportunity to sing, to pray, to praise, to read his word and hear his word. Amen. I hope you're glad for that today. Yes, Welcome to Midway Baptist Church in Athens, Alabama. I say that for the benefit of those that are viewing us and Hopefully not for the benefit of anyone that's here today, trusting that you know where you're at. But anyway, we're glad to be in the Lord's house, glad to have this opportunity. Let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer, all right? Heavenly Father, thank you for this day, for the joy. Thank you, Lord, for the privilege to be in a place of worship today. I pray that as we gather today, that you would just uh, be blessed by everything that we do, everything that we say, everything that we think. Lord, I just pray that we'll magnify, glorify, and honor you. Father, I pray today for each person that is gathered in the sanctuary. I pray for each one that is viewing us through electronic means. Father, I just pray that we will truly worship you today. I pray that as we come to that time when we look to your word, that you will that you will minister your word to our hearts today. And Father, that as you do so, we'll be receptive to what you do. And Father, we'll be obedient to what you'd have us to do. Amen. If it's to be saved, to be saved. If it's to draw closer, to draw closer. Whatever it may be, I pray that we will be not only a hearer, but a doer of your will. Lord, we love you today. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for this opportunity. In Jesus' name I pray and I ask you. Amen. Amen. Brother Jimmy. Well, good morning. Good morning. God is good. All the time. All the time. God is good. Amen. It's not good to kind of point out people in the congregation I know because some people might get their feelings hurt if you don't mention them. But I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> Here a couple of weeks ago, we had our number two son show up in church. I expected they got my number one son. Amen. So, Amen. Feel very blessed. Here's something I'm going to say very sanctimonious too. Uh, we were running late for church this morning, and Cindy said, "I'm driving." <laughs> <laughs> you know, they used to call them speed limit signs. We went by them things fast. I couldn't read that. But I think it has to be suggestion <laughs> We got the wrong time. Anyway, get out an inspiration book, if you will. Turn to page number 97. Let's all stand up. And we'll sing all three stanzas of I'm Standing on the Solid Rock. <laughs>
Linda's going to come and sing this morning. Any children going to children's church? Leek, ma'am, and Tina in the back. Okay. pray today that your testimony is that that home that Linda just sung about will be your eternal home. Yes. But I've got good news to bring. If it's not, it can be. It can be. 
Turn with me in your Bibles to the book of John, John chapter 6. John chapter 6. I think all of us understand the term last will and testament. Just to refresh ourselves if there's some doubt there. The last will and testament, it means the last desire of the person making the statements. And our laws take these statements very seriously. As a matter of fact, what we say in our last will and testament is enforceable by the laws of our land. So they are very, very important. It is the final decision that the person who makes this will, it is their final decision on the disposition of everything that they own. That is a will. I would encourage you just as a side note that if you haven't gotten one, you should get one. Uh, believe me, I've seen enough scenarios of issues and problems which occur when someone leaves the walk of this life and leaves their problems to somebody else. <laughs> Let me encourage you. Did you know that our Heavenly Father, our Creator, has a will? Now, He, to make it enforceable, doesn't have to die. For our God will never die. Amen. The scripture says, from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. Yes. It's hard for me at times to get my arms around what all that means. To think that God is present in the very now. He's present in the past. Yes. And he's present in the future. And he knows everything that happens all along the way. Yes. I want us to examine this morning the Father's will. The Father's will. Let's read in John chapter 6, verse 35. And I want you to uh, note, make a mental note, a, a written note, whichever way you want to do this, of the fact that the scripture says the Father has a will. Okay? John chapter 6, starting to read verse 35. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger. He who believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me. And the one who comes to me, I will by no means cast out. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. The will of him who sent me. This is the will of the Father who sent me, that of all he has given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up at the last day. And this is the will of him. This is the will of him who sent me. That everyone who sees the son and believes in him may have everlasting life. And I will raise him up at the last day. Did you know the numerous times that we were told that there was a will of the father? And so I want to share with you this morning just for a few minutes a message entitled, The Father's Will. But before we do anything, let's ask the Lord's blessing upon the preaching. Would you bow your heads with me? Father, in the name of Jesus, I want to thank you this morning for the opportunity that we have to come back to your word and be able to read it. Lord, to be able to uh, preach a message from it. Father, I just pray that as these things occur, that your blessing will be upon it. Lord, I, I know that your word is blessed. 
I know that your word is perfect and it is forever settled in heaven. Father, I pray that you will bless the preaching of it. Father, I pray you just anoint this morning, give the words that need to be said, anoint the hearer. Lord, that they'll receive the word with gladness, not just with uh, an intellect, but Lord, with the heart. And Lord, that we'll all be willing to do what you say to do in your word. Lord, we love you today. Thank you for loving us and for hearing us. In Jesus' name, we pray and we ask these blessings. Amen. Amen. Okay, John chapter 6 is a very, very interesting chapter in the Bible. Uh, I just want to back up just for a moment and give you just a little background that led up to Jesus making these statements that he made to those there that day about his Father's will. And not only did he make those statements for the benefit of those that were there that day, but he made those statements for the benefit of you and I as well. So let's get just a little bit of background on this chapter, on the events that led up to Jesus making these statements. We're told in John chapter 6 that Jesus has crossed over the Sea of Galilee. There's a great multitude of people which followed Jesus because they saw the signs of his healing. They saw these miracles that he had performed in healing the sick and the afflicted. Jesus is on the mountain and he has his disciples with him. And Jesus looks out and he sees this great multitude of people that are coming to him. And Jesus, as he looks at this great multitude of people, here's what he says to his disciples. Where can we buy bread to feed them? Where can we buy bread to feed them? And the scripture tells us that Jesus said this to test the disciples. Sometimes the word of God is given to us to test us as well. So anyway, Philip, one of the disciples, he answers it and he says, you know, Lord, we've got 200 dinar, but that's not enough to buy enough food or bread to feed this great multitude that's coming. Andrew, he speaks up and he says, you know, Lord, there's a little boy here that's got two fish and five loaves. As if to say, but Lord, that's not going to feed thousands of people. Jesus, by this time, the multitude has gathered and Jesus tells the multitude to sit down. And he receives the two fish and the five loaves of bread and he prays over. Then he has his disciples to come and start distributing it. And they do. And my friend, they feed in excess of 5,000 people with those two fish and five loaves of bread. And it was interesting to know that in verse 11 says those people got all they wanted. I know there's been times when times were a little rough and maybe we were in a hurry or some something or another happened, maybe the company came or something, it appeared like there wasn't a whole lot of food to, to go around. And so you'd be very, very uh, picky about how much you took. Now some of you, I can tell you, never had to worry about that. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, it was interesting to me to see that these people got all they wanted. They didn't go lacking. Some people may have had seconds or thirds. I don't know. It says they got all they wanted. You check me out, verse 11. Well, anyway, <clears throat> the disciples take up the fragments and uh, you know the story. There are 12 baskets full, basketfuls left over. <clears throat> Going to be enough for supper, isn't it? <clears throat> Started with two fish, and five loaves of bread, and now they got 12 baskets left over. Well, anyway, the people, they say, truly, this man must be a prophet. 
Jesus knows that they're about to come and force him to be their king. I mean, they had seen him heal. They had seen him take two fish, five loaves of bread, feed thousands. Why? This man is a prophet. This is a man that we need to be heading up the country. So they're going to come and try to take him as king. And when Jesus sees this, Jesus departs from them. And he goes once again back up into the mountain. Now, Scripture doesn't tell us here, John, but uh, <clears throat> I wonder, the disciples, I don't know if they thought he had left. I believe another passage of Scripture says he had told them, though, to leave. And so they get in their boats and they start back towards Capernaum. Well, on the way back to Capernaum on the sea, the, the, the winds get mighty strong. The storm comes up. Jesus sees the disciples in distress, and so Jesus goes walking on the water. Well, this great multitude, they wonder, where's he at? Where's he gone? <clears throat> they figured that he's gone back across the sea, so they hitch a ride on boats, and they themselves... They go back. And when they come to Jesus, this multitude, they say to Jesus, when did you come here? Another miracle has taken place. When did you come here? They saw the disciples leave, but they never saw him leave. And now they're wanting to know, well, how did he get from point A to point B? How did you get here? Jesus doesn't respond to that question, but he does say this. You did not seek me because you saw the signs, but because you ate. That's why you saw me. It, it makes me believe that even in the day and time which we are living, that there are a lot of people that will seek Jesus and come to Jesus when they have an immediate need. But other than that, they're not going to seek him and they're not going to come to him. So after that, Jesus says to those folks, he says, don't labor for food which perishes, but for food which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you. And they said to him, well, what shall we do that we may work the works of God? And folks, Listen to Jesus' response to that question. And it's in verse 29. Jesus said, here's what you need to work to do to have salvation. You believe in him in whom he sent. Amen. That's the works that we need to do. Believe in him whom he sent. Amen. Now the multitude... They want another sign that they can see and believe. Jesus said to them, he said, my father gives you the true bread from heaven and it is who it is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And they say to the Lord, Lord, give us this bread. And that's where we picked up with our scripture reading. The bread that they were needing was the will of the Father. It was the will of the Father. Jesus in this passage of Scripture tells us what the will of the Father is. Listen to these. These things are found in this passage that we have read. There were four things, at least four things that Jesus told them the will of the Father was. Number one, all to see the Son. Let's look at verse 40 once again. And this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son, the will of the Father is that they see the Son. They see Jesus for who he is and what he is. Don't see him for what he's not and for who he is not. But see him as the only begotten son of God. It is the father's will. 
that not only they of that day see Jesus as the Son, but it is the Father's will that all of us see Jesus as the Son. Not the son of Mary and not the son of Joseph. While Mary was the biological mother that bore him in her womb, Joseph was a stepdad. Jesus is the son of the heavenly father. He is the only begotten son of the heavenly father. Amen. And God's will is that you and I, just as those people, saw him in that capacity Amen. as the son of God. Now, not only does he say in verse 40 to see him, but to believe in him. Verse 40 this is the will of him who sent me that everyone who sees the son believes in him. Believes in him. These folks that were following Jesus, we started out in John chapter 6 seeing that they followed Jesus because they saw the healings that he had done. And then after they came across the Sea of Galilee, they saw the miracle of feeding the thousands with the five fish or the two fish and the five loaves. Then they had a pretty good inkling that in some miraculous way, he crossed back uh, that sea to Capernaum. And so back at Capernaum, they said to him, we want to see another sign from you. But God's will is that you have seen him and that you believe in him. Roll fast forward to today. So many are wanting to see some miraculous sign that Jesus is the son of God. Some are wanting to see a miraculous sign that God does exist. We know who Jesus is. And we know that God does exist because the word of God proclaims it and things about us proclaim it. And the very God consciousness put in us when we became life bears record to the fact that he does and is in existence. These are the things that are revealed to us that we might believe who he is. So God's will is that people see Jesus and that they believe in Jesus. Amen. And then on in verse 40, it says that everyone who sees the son and believes in him may have everlasting life. You remember something I said at the very onset of the message about a last will and testament? That it was a legal thing. It was the desire of that one that was deceased that these things be carried out and that these things had the enforcement of law behind it. My friend, God in his will has said I want everyone that sees Jesus and everyone that believes in Jesus, I want them to have everlasting life. Amen. You know, I go back to what, uh, what Jesus told that multitude. All right, Lord, <clears throat> what work is it that we can do that we may have this that you speak of? And Jesus said, I'm going to tell you what work you can do. Believe. 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 My friend, it amazes me. It amazes me how that so many times folks want to add something to the will of the Father in order to have that everlasting life. But God plainly says, 
If you want this, see the Son for who He is and believe in the Son for whom He is and I will give you everlasting life. Amen. God's will is that I have everlasting life. God's will is that you have everlasting life. Some folks have this mental image or picture in their head or in their heart <clears throat> that God is just sitting upon that throne that he's sitting upon and just waiting to crush people under his thumb of judgment. My friend, that's not the truth. Hey, listen, I'm going to give you another place where it talks about the will of God. And it's in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. And it says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promises, but is long suffered to usward, not willing, there's that word will, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. The will of the Father is that we have everlasting life. It's not God's will. The scripture says, does God have pleasure in the destruction of the wicked? No. The will of the Father is that they be saved. I'm reminded of Revelation 22, 17. Whoever is thirsty, come and drink of the water of life. I'm reminded of Isaiah 55, verse 1. Whosoever will come and take of this water. You know, God doesn't want us to perish, but God wants us to have everlasting life. Amen. And then I want you to notice the fourth thing that is said here in verse 40. And this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son believes in him, may have everlasting life and I will raise him up at the last day. Now folks, listen. Uh, I, 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 I've preached a lot of funerals in my years of ministry. Uh, and some of those are easier than others to preach. I, I, and I hope you know what I mean when I say that. I, I guess a better way would be to say I've conducted funerals. For you say you preach your funeral while you live. Okay. I've conducted a lot of funerals. And I'm going to tell you what. It sure is a lot easier to conduct a funeral when you know the testimony of the deceased. And you know that that testimony of the deceased is that they trusted Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior. And let me tell you what really just puts the icing on the cake, so to speak is when you have noticed their life demonstrates that their testimony is true. Yes. Amen. 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 Reminds you of that scripture, you're known by the fruit they bear. <laughs> it makes it sweet. And, and it gives me great joy when I say, look, what you're looking upon today is nothing more than the tent, is nothing more than the house, it's nothing more than the tabernacle where they used to live. They've gone on to be with the Lord and they have that spiritual body. They're in the very presence of God Almighty right now. They have already beheld the Lamb of God. They are enjoying the beauties of that place called heaven. They have been reacquainted with loved ones that have gone on. But listen, that ain't all. For there's coming a day and there's coming an hour when Jesus is going to say, all right, Father, I'm going after them. You've told me to go. And he comes and here come those saints in those spiritual bodies and they're in the heaven with him. And boy, they blast through the atmosphere into the ground or into the sea or wherever it may be. And out of that comes a glorified body fashion like unto the body of Christ. And they are in that body and they go up to be with the Lord and those of us that are alive will be changed in a moment and twinkling of an eye and we'll go up there with them. Amen. 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 
Folks, that's the will of the Father. It's the will of the Father. And listen, we use an expression at times that says, God called them home. Well, that's true. God calls them home. Calls our loved ones home. And one day he's going to call you and I home. If we don't go up in the rapture, he's going he to call us. Uh, I'm so glad that not only does he call us, but he comes to get us. <laughs> comes to get us. That's, a, that's another message, I guess, for another time. But he does come to get us. Someone said, where do you get that? The Bible says that there was a rich man that died and in hell he lift up his eyes. The Bible says that before he lift up his eyes in hell he was buried. But there was another man in that same story by the name of Lazarus. And the Bible says the angels bore him into Abraham's bosom. Amen. Amen. Yes, so anyway, one day the Lord is going to call us and come and get us and carry us to that place. But then one day he's going to bring us back and let us have one of them glorified bodies like his body. Can you imagine? Can you imagine a glorified body? I mean, we don't have a lot of insight into it, but we have some. Uh, we look at Jesus after the resurrection of, of what he was able to do. And the scripture says, we'll have a glorified body fashioned like it unto the Son of God. Can you imagine just being able to walk through walls? <laughs> you know, I don't know. I, now, now listen, because I say this don't mean it happens at my house. But you know, uh, when when one spouse gets to nagging at the other spouse, you know, all you gotta, all you gotta do is just walk out of the wall. <laughs> no, you can't do that, can you? You're confined. <laughs> Well, I don't believe it's going to be any nagging in our eternal home, but uh, I don't think there will be, but it's nice to know if it was, you can just walk away from it. <laughs> can you imagine to be able to just, in a snap of a finger, be millions of miles away? Yeah. That's unreal. It is unreal. No wonder the scripture says, but as it is written, I have not seen or near ear heard nor hath it entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. My friend, listen. All of these things, all of these things are the Father's will. Now I don't know about you, but to me it sounds mighty good. Yeah. Really? Sounds mighty good. As a matter of fact, it's better than that food you eat. And you say, I believe I'll have a second helping with that. <laughs> yeah, this is better than that. This is better than that. So there is a very important question that we must ask. And here's that question. How do I get identified in that wheel? I think it's never happened to me, but I know of others that it has happened to that the wheel gets red and they're not part of it. Well, folks, this wheel of God that I've just read is not a wheel that everyone can claim to be a part of it. The only way that you can claim to be a part of this wheel is to be an heir. You, you got to be an heir. Now, here's what God says. This is what Jesus says. This is what the Holy Spirit says. This is what the Word of God says. He came unto his own. His own received him not. But to as many as received him, to them gave him power to become the sons of God. Amen. You see, you become an heir by becoming a son or daughter. And you become a son or a daughter of Christ or of God and a brother with Christ by receiving Christ as your personal Savior. You receive. You know, 
there are those that make this complicated. And God forbid that I would be one of those that would make it complicated on how to become an heir, how to become a child of God. I want to tell you what the scripture does not say. Sometimes it helps to know what does not, or to know what is not said to understand what is said. Here's what is not said. There is nothing in scripture that says you become a son by a religious ceremony. There is nothing in scripture about you becoming a son or a child of God by being a good, moral, righteous person. Oftentimes, as ministers or in conversation about people that have just died, you will hear, well, they were a good, moral person. Or they were a good, righteous person. My friend, being a good moral person, a good righteous person in the way that man views righteousness is not the way you become a son of God or an heir of God. For the scripture says that not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he hath saved us. There is nothing in scripture about bringing a wheelbarrow full of good works. There is nothing in scripture about giving enough money. Oh, let me tell you, I'm not going to say I've heard this here. I don't think I have. Uh, but I've heard it at other places. Well, bless God, I'll just quit giving to that church. I've heard of churches where people have said, starving out. I'm serious. Starving out. My friend, I want you to know that anyone that thinks it is their money and the way their money is spent is what's going to get them into the will of God. It does not do it. There's nothing about joining a church that makes you a son of God or a child of God. There's nothing about it. I love to duck you back here, but there is nothing that goes on in that baptistry that makes you an heir of God. Amen. That's right. Preach it. Nothing. Well then, what is it? Look at verse 37 of our text. Verse 37 says, All that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will by no means cast out. We come to Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. Now listen, some, I read, I, well, first of all, I, I heard a preacher and then I read another preacher. Uh, I remember ever so slightly what J. Vernon McGee said about this verse. He said, all that the Father gives me will come to me. He said, I've heard that passage of scripture used as election and I've heard it used as for whosoever will. He said, I used to have a real good answer about that. He said, but I've gotten older and I forgot what that answer was. <laughs> he said, so I don't try to argue that verse anymore. But let me just very simply tell you what it means when the scripture says that those that are Benefactors of the will of the Father are those that the Father gives to Jesus. What does it mean that the Father gives us to Jesus? Well, bear with me just for a moment, and I'm going to be done, okay? Number one, do you know that God has revealed himself to every one of us? If if the person is, I looked across the congregation, I don't see anyone in this category. I was going to say a person may be so young that they have not come to a realization yet. But I grant you that there's not a one of us in this congregation that God has not revealed himself to us. Sir. Amen. Well, my friend, if that were true, then the word of God's not true. 
For the book of Romans chapter 1 verses 18 through 21 bear record that God reveals himself to mankind. Okay? Now, if God reveals himself to us, he also does something else. I, I want you to flip over with me to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. And I want you to listen to a very, uh, to me, a very, very interesting, very truthful verse of Scripture. Thank God for it. Romans chapter 12. Paul writing verse 3 of the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Romans 12 verse 3. For I say, through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly. Now listen to this. As God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. God has not only revealed himself to us, but God has given us a measure of faith whereby we can accept him. Amen. Amen. And do you know what comes by faith? So then faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. You know what comes by it? For by grace are you saved through faith that not of yourself it's a gift of God, not of works lest any man should boast. God has given the capacity to every one of us to know him and to believe in him. And when we know him and when we believe in him, we believe in his son and God gives us to his son. And when God gives us to his son, his son said, oh, and rest assuredly, I'll never cast you out. You are, as, as we say, signed, sealed, and delivered. Signed, sealed, and delivered. Signed in the blood of Jesus. Delivered by God to Christ. Signed, sealed, and delivered. And one day to glory we go. Amen. I tell you what, I like the Father's will. Amen. I hope you do. I hope that you realize what you've got to do to become part of it. And that is to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. Have you done that today? Have you done that today? I tell you, one of the clearest illustrations of somebody getting saved was a thief on the cross. Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Well, he was. He was, that's exactly right. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. I heard a preacher preaching this past week and I could tell what denomination he was by what he said. He said, well, let me tell you what all that really means. And he went on to give a, a litmus list of things that that meant and it was, it was consummated at the end by water baptism. Mm -hmm. I tell you what, I'm just going to accept what Jesus said. Amen. Mm -hmm. Whosoever believeth in me shall not perish but have everlasting life. In the will of the Father. That's God's will for you and for me. And I pray that you've experienced it. Would you bow your heads with me? Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you for the word this morning. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to preach your word. And I just pray you've been honored by each and everything that's been said. Lord, speak continuously to our hearts. If there is one in this congregation, that's never been saved, I pray today will be the day they come to this altar and receive Christ as their Savior. For that one that is saved but is walking contrary to you, I pray today will be the day they rededicate their life. And I pray these blessings not only upon us that are here in the sanctuary, but I pray upon those that are watching us as well. And I pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. My friend, let's stand together. We're going to sing a hymn of invitation. The broadcast will be over.